I too offer you greetings into a time of worship as we gather in the name of Christ. We do so in the season of Epiphany, the season in which we have a movement from darkness into light and then into action. How God calls us forth to bring that light, God's light, into all places in the world, including our own lives, our own church, and then far and wide and beyond. It's a season in which we remember, we rehearse, we celebrate the gift of baptism because it has been from the very beginning, do you remember? When God first created the heavens and the earth and the waters came down and God called forth life from those waters and Jesus himself baptized and so the waters flow down from on high and into the baptismal font. In the days of Noah, God again washed the earth with a flood, cleansing us, renewing us, calling forth ourselves, us, from a place of wickedness and darkness into the marvelous light. In the days of Jonah, it's so it happens again. On this day, we plunge into the depths of the sea with Jonah, and we renew again baptism. Baptism that causes us to radically shift and change. Jonah himself experienced this, as did the people of Nineveh. We are called to participate in this baptismal act of God as we are called into discipleship, into discipleship with one another. And so I share with you this passage from the Gospel of Mark. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming this good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. As they went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men there. And they followed him into more light. More light, more truth is breaking from your word. More light, more truth, Holy Spirit, help us hear what needs to be in our call to worship. We pray that Jesus' call, come follow me, might again reverberate through our souls today as we seek more light. May we hear again the message of the one who brings good news of more hope. May we hear again the challenge to be disciples of Jesus as we seek more truth. May we hear again eternal words of hope, which tell us that however dark the world becomes, the darkness cannot ever overcome the radiant light of this Holy One, Jesus. May we hear again those simple words, come, follow me, and may we come just as we are and know again the depth of God's grace and love. light, more truth is breaking from your word. More light, more truth, Holy Spirit, help us hear what needs to be heard. Help us hear what needs to be heard. 
Let us pray. Holy God, we seek the power of your spirit to bring change and transformation to the peoples of the world, as did those early fishermen. Give us the power to provide the same kind of hope for the world weary as they brought to theirs. Give us the vision of a world transformed. And so we sing, open my eyes that I may see. seated. In a time of worship, as we meet our Lord, we come into time of truth-telling. That means it's a moment in a time of confession to say, this is how it is in the condition of my life, in our world, and we name it. We name it so that we can then invite the power of the living God into those places those places where we will experience a darkness, where we will experience ourselves out of control and needing, indeed, the power of God in our lives to be who God calls us to be. And so, in the days of Jonah, uh, there was so much strife. There was wickedness all around. It would make the headlines flashing the news every night. In the days of Jonah, in Nineveh, in Jonah's own heart, in so many ways, there were signs of just darkness that seemed to pervade over the earth. Listen to this interplay of headlines between today's headlines and headlines from the days of Jonah. Extra, extra, read all about it. Man robs casino on Las Vegas Boulevard. Large fish swallows Jonah whole. Luxury ship runs aground off Italy. Eleven presumed dead. Great wind on the seas threatens to break up ships. Extra, extra, read all about it. Lord declares Ninevites wicked. Fire rips through Reno, many homes destroyed. Millions stranded as the Chinese New Year's approaches. Jonah proclaims 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Snowstorm cripples the Pacific Northwest. Extra, extra, read all about it. Flooding destroys lives and homes in Eastern Oregon. Greece on the verge of default. Europe on the brink of financial meltdown. Will the U.S. be sucked into the apocalypse? Thousands of people unemployed. Kodak declares bankruptcy. Another candidate drops out of the race as millions of dollars are spent on a smear campaign. King of Nineveh disrobes, wears sackcloth, sits in ashes. Extra, extra, extra read all about it. And so the headlines, they keep coming. They bring into our own minds and our own thoughts just what's happening in our world and in our lives and where we need the light all the more. Hear these words from Jonah in the first chapter. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once into Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah, he set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. 
So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah was trying to flee a place in which he did not want to go. He didn't want to be obedient or he didn't want to go into that place of Nineveh where there was so much, so much trouble. There had been for generations in Nineveh. There had been for the entire life of Jonah and so, so much longer. And Jonah had been hearing about it in his own lifetime. From being a child, he would hear about the evils of Nineveh and those people who would come and overtake nations and tribes all around them and bring them into captivity, including the people of Judah, including Jonah's own people, the warring Assyrians from the capital of Nineveh, were known for their vengeance. They were known for their warlike behavior in life. They invented war machines that the world had never, never even thought possible, ways of torture and ways of, of taking over a city and bringing in devastation to it. No one had ever dreamed that such darkness would ever exist in the hearts of men and women that any nation around them would ever act out in that kind of a way. But the people of Nineveh, the kings of Nineveh through the centuries and generations, seemed to have this thirst for more power. They had this thirst for overtaking more and more nations around them. And they would go into, the, into those nations around them, like into Judah, and there they would overthrow them, and they would take hold of the, 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 the young men, and they would bring them into their own armies, and they would... They would torture, they would rape, they would kill in order to intimidate the people of that nation they were overthrowing, in order to make them cower before them so they would give up and so they would go and do whatever was demanded of them. They practiced ways of torture that just make us cringe, chills run up and down the spine, not imagining that women and children and Men would be watching friends and neighbors and family members undergoing torture in front of their very eyes in public square. It was how they would get them to be obedient to the people of Nineveh and to the king. They would bring them into that city and there they would be as slaves to build opulent palaces which were known the world over as a place where there were lush gardens in the middle of a dry land in which they would bring in animals that they would discover all around the region and make zoos. And, and it would be a place of opulence. It would be a place in which there was a library that would be renowned, that would have a collection of literature and books and sciences and religions and language that would astound the world. And that even, even now, as the excavations happen and it's discovered, the incredible opulence and plenty and how much they had in that city of Nineveh, a powerful place, which they took the wealth of all of their neighbors into their own selves. They took all of the knowledge from all around them for themselves, and they held on to it. And they brought a darkness, a darkness into the world that was a wickedness, a wickedness that, 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 that we can only just, just imagine in all of our fears that would be happening. That's the place where Jonah was called. That's where Jonah was called to go to bring the news of God's call to repentance. The news that God was calling them to repent from wicked and evil ways. But the fear that Jonah had and the concern that Jonah had is that indeed they would repent. And knowing God, they would be forgiven. And Jonah could hardly stand for that to go into that place of Nineveh and bring a good word, a good word to such awful people. How could he do it? He struggled with it so, as we will, as we ourselves discover a struggle sometimes to bring light into dark places in our own souls or in our own world, we too can be like that, like a Jonah who's not sure quite how to share the good news with the world and with others, especially when it seems as though the other, do they deserve? Should they have that opportunity to have a mercy proclaimed to them or not? 
It's a good news that we're called to share. And so we look and say, what is that light? What is that mysterious light that comes, that comes into our waywardness and our wickedness? What is that mysterious light that comes, comes from beyond us in our ways of living and in our world filled with continual chaos and wickedness? What is that mysterious light that comes, that transcends our darkness and comes into our world? A mysterious light that brings hope, that brings newness of life. What is that light? that the light that breaks into the darknesses of our life is God. God who hears our gentle prayers, our agonizing calls, our hopes and dreams. Will you pray with me? 
Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, our God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to you out of my distress, and you answered me. Eternal God, you are the one who calls to us as deep calls to deep. Let your voice reverberate and shake in the very depths of our souls. For out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You have cast us into places of deep darkness, into the very heart of the seas of turbulence. Your floods have surrounded us, and your waves have passed over our heads, and yet we see your light breaking into our darkness, and so we lift to you these our silent prayers. Lord God, hear us as we call to you, even when we feel that we have been driven from your sight, even when we ask from the depths of our despair, from places of addiction, from places of illness, from places of loneliness, how, O oh God, shall I look again at your holy temple? Even in that time, your hand is upon us. Even when the waters seem to close in around us as we search for jobs, as we struggle to understand deadly headline news, you surround me with your comforting arms, supporting us even when we feel as if we will never see light again. Because you bring us up out of the pit, you are with us even as we feel our lives sinking. You lift us up and remember us by name, O oh Lord. And our prayers come to you in this your holy temple. And with the voice of thanksgiving, you hear our sacrifice of prayer. You hear that we will pay to you our lives, our faith, our hope. For this deliverance belongs to you, O Lord. For you are the almighty deliverer, and through your Son, Jesus Christ, you bring us back to the shores of life, shattering our darkness, securing our feet upon the sands of your salvation, so that we might rise eternally and live a life of meaning and purpose. And so, hear these our prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, as a people of courage and confidence, let us be bold and pray together this prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jonah received God's call. He ran in the other direction. God brought him around as he was thrown into the seas, into the depths of those baptismal waters that churned him and that, that turned him over and upside down, swallowed by a great fish. And in the belly of that fish, he had a, a time of repentance of the turning of his spirit and his soul as he prayed out to God. God heard his prayers. Jonah was sharing that which was in his heart and his soul. He, he struggled with what it means to be called by God, what it means to be called by God to pronounce the light in the midst of a darkness. And so we hear this word, which Jonah then came, to deliver to the people of Nineveh in the third chapter. Open your hearts, receive this word. I invite you to open a Bible, too to follow along, to see the word, to let it come into your spirit and into your life so that you too would be changed. 
The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, they put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. For this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jonah was called to do a job. He had his, his calling and, and the way in this world that he was to live it out. He had a job to do. Do you recall your first job? What was it? Really, tell me. What was your first job? Call it out. What was it? Babysitting? Cutting the grass? Giving towels out at a swimming pool? Hey, dishwasher? In a department store? What'd you say? As a janitor? <laughs> the, what was that? Oh, a pin in a bowling alley before the automation of the, of the pins in the bowling alley. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you can certainly start the memories moving, can't you? When you start to think about those, those first jobs that you had, what they were like and the experience of them. Oh, those first jobs, I remember m my first job, it was, well, it was mowing lawns was kind of the first job that I had, but the first job that I had that I really had a paycheck from somebody was being a paper boy. Uh, I, I liked that job when I got the, paper, when I got the paycheck. I liked that job. <laughs> I didn't like the job in the wintertime in Minnesota. No, that was not good. Even in the summer, I did not like the job of delivering papers because I would much rather be out on the lake. I'd rather, much rather be out boating. I'd rather, much rather be out fishing than, than delivering the papers. It was a good job, but it wasn't a good job. You know, I struggled with it many times and whether or not I really wanted to keep that job going, but I did it. I kept on doing the job. I kept on delivering those papers. Reminds me of a newsboy who was standing on the corner with a stack of papers and he was yelling to everybody, read all about it, read all about it. 50 people swindled. A guy comes along and says, 50 people swindled. You've got to be kidding. Let me buy one of those papers. He bought the paper. He looks at it, and then he says to the kid, hey, kid, what are you trying to pull off here? This is, this is old news. This is papers a few days old. And the boy doesn't even say anything to the man, just says, read all about it. Read all about it. 51 people swindled, he says. <laughs> Calling out the headlines, delivering news. Those times when I was delivering the news, it was kind of easy going. It was, a, it was a nice kind of a job most of the time. I, I, I was reading a bit about those toughest jobs in America and remembering about a, an old TV show. It wasn't all that old. It wasn't just about a few years ago. that a TV show was on that, that people would go and do these toughest jobs in America, these down and dirty and dangerous kind of jobs. You maybe remember that show. It didn't last very long, but they would get out into the field and, and do these kind of jobs, and the last show that they had was, was just kind of, uh, what are the worst of the worst kind of jobs that are out there? And the jobs that kind of came to the surface for them were the, were the jobs of bullfighting and oil drilling and logging and fishing. Those were the lowest paid and the most dangerous of jobs. Yeah, getting out in a fishing boat a dangerous kind of place to be on an oil rig. And they weren't paying nearly enough for the danger that it would be doing that kind of a job. The job Jonah was called in to do had its dangers too. Certainly it doesn't seem like a whole lot. To be a prophet, to go out and to announce the news of repentance, to go out and among the streets in Nineveh and, and say, repent, for in 40 days you'll be overturned, but a dangerous job it was. Because where did Jonah go but into the heart of the enemy's territory, into the depths of a darkness? It would bring up within him, no doubt, so many fears, so much anger, so much hurt, 
so much pain. It would bring up for Jonah in his heart, wouldn't it? A place of prejudice and judgment. A judgment upon a people who had hurt his people and so many others for so long. A hard job indeed it would be to proclaim to the people of Nineveh an opportunity to begin again, to have a second chance, to receive the grace of God even if you wouldn't think and dream in your wildest imagination that they'd ever take God up on it, that they'd ever repent, still, how can you go in to a territory like that after so much and proclaim light in darkness, come out and have a new day and a new chance? Jonah went and he proclaimed to the people of Nineveh, repent and believe. And they turned from their ways. But Jonah didn't like it. He struggled with that intensely. Well, when we read this story, we often read it from the eyes of a child, or as we did when we were children in Sunday school, and we read about that big fish or that whale, and, and we read about it with, with a child's delight. And it's, and it's a story that just has entertainment value even in it, and, and, and a way that, that as a child that, that you'll be able to dream and imagine it's a fanciful kind of a tale that's told. But there's an intensity to this story. There is a way that this story gets to the very bottom line in the heart and the soul of, of our humanness, of our waywardness, of even a darkness that stirs within us, God's people, religious folks, folks who regularly go to church like Jonah who regularly read the scriptures and who are called God's chosen ones and, and who are in this path of, of knowing God's word and moving in it and having lived within God's word their whole life and for generations and just being enfolded by God's goodness and grace in our lives. And, and it even shows that within Jonah's heart there's this struggle, this struggle about bringing light into darkness. And that even away in his own heart there needs to be a transformation there needs to be this time of repentance and this turning about and this shifting of his own gaze in life. In a way, what makes it so difficult and so hard to move into this call, this call of bringing light into darkness? It starts first, maybe, because of Jonah's prejudice, because of his hate, because of the judgment that he feels upon other people, questioning whether they're deserving of it. It's a prejudice and a judgment that can come within our own hearts here and now, that call us to sometimes be like Jonah was then, even today. We're called to identify places of prejudice within our own minds and ways of thinking, how we view other people in other lands, or even neighbors next to us, or even family members within our own households, which we will become prejudiced or judgmental toward and against because of old time hurt and long time pain that's been there festering away. There was Jonah right there. Is that the most difficult place to try to bring light into that place of darkness when it becomes so personal? It comes home to us. It's kind of different, isn't it, when we think about it of a people a long way away and a long time ago, or even a people today and yet far away on the other side of the world. It's another thing to, to think about bringing a good news elsewhere in another place for somebody else to do it, but when it comes home and comes to my own life and relationships and how God is calling for a repentance to start right here and now in the own dark places of prejudice and judgmentalism in my own life, causes us to reflect a bit, should cause us to begin to stir beyond just a children's story and to realize that I'm Jonah too, and so are you. And we're struggling in that. What makes it so hard to bring light into the darkness when it seems as though that should be a joy and a delight for all, that we should run and say, God, sign me up. Let me bring that good news that you bring to all people in all places. No, let me do it, God, and we would run to the opportunity. We wonder about Jonah. Why didn't he go there? Why did he run in the opposite direction? But that prejudice and judgmentalism gripped him so tightly. And the more I look at it 
and see into it and learn about the people of Nineveh and the generations in which they had over that whole region, I can understand and appreciate and can really sense that I too can easily be a Jonah and run from such a place. But then God doesn't let us run too far. God calls to us. His provenient grace is always after us and calling us back to this way. And God never gives up about bringing light, God's light, to all of God's people, to all of God's children, in every place and in every opportunity. And we are the ones who have this good news and are called into it. And when it's most difficult is when it will become the most profound and life-changing and transformative for you, for your neighbor, for all God's people. What makes it so tough to bring light into the darkness? Maybe it's also, uh, it is also, a misdirected will. The way in which we get confused about whose will are we following. There's this freedom of will that we have. It's a gift to us from God to have free wills. But we'll confuse then and, and, and start believing that ours, that my will, that your will, is the will that dominates all and the will that ought to be superior over all. And we'll confuse it with the very will of God in our lives. And we'll start tracking other than God's will. Start journeying and moving off into disobedience or being obedient to something other and to someone other than God. So that misdirected will of ours that gets confused and all tangled up into our wants and our wishes and our desires and, and are running away from God, now that can be something that so clearly makes it tough to bring darkness into the world. The message of Jonah is all about hearing the word of God and obeying it. And that's not easy to do for us. Independent people, people who have a strong will and determination in our own right and in our own lives, it's not a simple, easy thing to do because we have that strong calling for ourselves to achieve, uh, to, to realize our own personal dreams and aspirations. But we'll look where it got the people of Nineveh because it kept on mounding up greater and greater their dreams and their aspirations and their desire for more and more opulence and wealth and power. That's a misdirected will in a people that has lasted for generation. It becomes generational and then it becomes a sickness within. That's hard to see. It's hard to step back and, and get a sense out of it and see it for what it is until there's this incredible shakeup until there's this throwing into the sea and into the depths, until there's this overthrow and everything is, is turned upside down and then maybe we can, we can see. Jonah went into the city of Nineveh. Finally, he went into God's will. Instead of running in the other direction, seeing and searching his own personal will, he began to see the will of God and knowing he needed to follow God's will for his life people of Nineveh needed to see God's will. How do you need to see the will of God? To realize and to see how God's will needs to just overcome and, and take hold of your own personal will. And so when that happens and you become one with God's will, how oh, that is where the light is found. That's where new life and recreation and redemption is experienced. When we step into the will of God, and we seek how God's will to be made known for ourselves and for all the world. So Jonah disobeyed God, and it was a near-death experience for him. The people of Nineveh disobeyed God, and it was a near-death experience for them. But that's baptism. Baptism is a near-death experience, an experience in which we don't think there's another breath for us, in which my own will and my own what might come to an end. And all of a sudden, I'm shifted around and I, and, I, and I realize in order to have the next breath in life, I've got to reach up and toward the light of God and, 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 and shift my whole perspective and my whole life toward God and into God. And that's baptism. 
lifting us up from the depths into the new light, the light of God. We often talk about having a mission, a mission that's both individual mission, a mission of a community, a mission of a church. What is our mission? We'll talk about shaping our own mission and having a vision for ourselves and, and deciding what it is and, and, and crafting and writing it down. This is my mission and my vision in life, and it carries us far. And there's a whole movement that has been over, over quite some time about having those personal mission statements and a church having its own mission statement. But the truth is, it never can be my mission statement or the church's mission statement, but it always needs to be about the mission of God. God's mission is the only mission that counts. And it's when we, the people of God, when the church begins to have its mission be totally what God's mission is all about. The question is whether the mission of God has a prophet, whether the mission of God has a disciple, whether the mission of God has a church or not. We're called to follow after and be obedient to the mission and will of God. The movement of God coming into our world to bring light and hope to all. And that's also what makes it so difficult, so tough to bring light into the darkness. It's a lack of hope, a lack of hope that we can often have in our world when we see all these bad news headlines around. We can have a lack of hope in our lives when we wonder. We wonder if we're left to our own demise or if God is there and present and will question and will wonder about it all. You know, when a star explodes off in a distant galaxy, it takes thousands of years for that light to travel to get here. 180,000 miles a second, that light will travel across the universe to get to us. But it takes thousands of years for it to break through all of the space and all of the darkness to get to us the great distance of the star means that even though the brilliance of the explosion travels so fast that it takes generations and generations for the light to reach us. And even our most powerful telescopes just can reach out into space and look. They too do not perceive and see this light for so very long. Only when the light finally reaches us can we acknowledge that there's been a power explosion an explosion that has burst out into the universe, that has cast a light all the way across the universe, a power that is so forceful and so incredible that it takes generations for that light to persist and keep on moving. The light of God is that powerful explosion that happens. It's like the very beginning when God said, let there be light. And there was this enormous explosion in the universe because the light of God burst into our darkness and it will never give up. And it keeps on moving through generation after generation and through all of time in order to bring us hope, in order to bring us light, in order to save us, in order to rescue us from chaos and from darkness. And God never gives up on it. will keep on persevering and pursuing us to the ends of the earth and to ends of all of time. It is what we are called to participate in, to be a part of, to never give up on that. We too are called to never give up hope, to never give up the vision of God, to never give up on bringing light into the darkness, no matter how much we may have that prejudice, that pain, that judgmentalism. Let God's light overcome that and transform you. Let God change your life in such a dramatic way that you too will have that explosion of a light that causes you to proclaim just as Paul did or just as Hebrews did in in chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every single weight, every single sin that ever clings so closely to us, and let us run with a perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame, And he's taken his seat at the right hand of God, on the throne of God. Consider the one who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you too may never grow weary. 
you too may never lose heart in your own struggle against sin in your life in this world and have not resisted to the point then of giving up. So may you too be that child of God who keeps on running the race and moving forward just as God calls us. May we discover that place of obedience. May we see the light that is cast all around us, a power so magnificent and so wondrous that we can hardly even put a name to it, a name to it that's the name of love, that's the name of Christ Jesus. What light is this? It's the light of Jesus in our lives. He calls us to overcome the darkness within the soul, within the neighborhood, within the world. Now, can we name a love? Indeed, we can. Let us sing. sisters, you may be seated. In the process of naming the darkness, of being called to share the light, we are confronted with the reality that we are not a people who enjoy good news. When Jonah was called to go to Nineveh, he threw himself into the ocean because he didn't want to see people change. He didn't want to acknowledge that God was a God of forgiveness and repentance. When Jonah is successful in his ministry in Nineveh, he goes and pouts on a hill and says, God, just let me die. I'm so miserable that this went well for you. And God says, Jonah, Jonah, you shared good news. Why are you upset? And he says, because you are a God of forgiveness whose love is abounding and steadfast. And I don't know if I can participate in that. Sometimes we like to sit in the bad news. That's why we love the headlines that say, extra, extra, read all about it. The world is going to pot. <laughs> it's bad. And you will buy those papers. But imagine for a second. If instead of craving that kind of bad news, your heart was filled all the time with the longing and desire for good news. And imagine for a second that this whole world is filled with people who want to hear the good news you could share. As we read through the headlines that you all sent to us this week, good news headlines, some of you responded, it took me three hours to find good news. Three hours. One person responded with headlines that she dreams every day to hear, longing for good news that will bring us into a world of peace, a world that is shaped by God's hand. Brothers and sisters, you are the messengers, and you bear the good news. 
And so I challenge you to imagine what headline you will shout out to the masses of people waiting. I challenge you not to be like Jonah and think, grumble, grumble, God, I just want people to be unhappy because I'm unhappy. I want you to go forth from this place to share the word of salvation, to shout things out like, extra, extra, read all about it. Henderson ranked second safest city in the US. Pay cuts coming for corrupt CEOs. A man aided drivers saved this woman miles later. God relents and saves Nineveh. Donor gives cancer patient $10,000. Secret Santas pay strangers' layaway bills at Kmart. Scientists rediscover rarest U.S. bumblebee. God's gracious mercy is seen in the neighbors. Extra, extra, read all about it. Teen rescues woman from fire. Humble soldier saves four, gets rare medal for heroism. Couple preparing to welcome 72nd foster child. God's love is known through the actions of God's people. All, All homeless have, have found homes, are warm and well fed tonight. Everyone well fed tonight. No, no crimes were committed, committed today. Kingdom of God is here now. Share the good news, brothers and sisters. Will you lift up your offerings as the ushers come forward?
Almighty God, our gifts given to you, that we might be your instruments of sharing the good news. Make us headlines of peace and call us forth as disciples in faith. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. amen. Please remain standing for our song which sends us into the world, bringing the light of Christ to all. In Christ there is no east or west. In Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. In Christ shall true hearts everywhere their high communion find. His service is the golden cord close binding humankind. In Christ now meet both east and west, in him meet south and north. All Christly souls are one in him throughout the whole wide earth. The voice of God calling long ago. The voice of God calling today. The voice compelling Jonah to go. The voice compelling us to go. The voice compelling Jonah to share the good news of God's redemptive love. The voice compelling us to share the good news of God's redemptive love. With those who would be enemies. With those who are our enemies. The people of Nineveh, beloved of God. The people of the world, beloved by God. The voice calling long ago. The voice calling today. Amen.